Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech, or the press, or the right of the people peacefully to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. But what does that really mean? Fairly quickly after the passage of the Bill of Rights in 1791, Congress clarified a difference between protected and unprotected speech. The three unprotected types of speech being fighting words, or speech that incites violence, obscenity, and libel, or speech that is reckless and or false in nature. But it has always been different in schools. Historically, schools have had the right to completely restrict student speech to the benefit of the education experience. That has since changed some, but not entirely. So where does the school start restricting speech, and for what cause? Um, I think for us, and it's not a clear line, it has to come down to the, the three points that were brought out in TLO, which are safety, order, and discipline. Safety, order, and discipline. Those three ideas were first presented to the Supreme Court in 1985, during TLO versus New Jersey. Let's go back a little bit further. 1969, during the Vietnam War, the Tinker siblings decided to attend a Des Moines public school sporting black armbands to protest the war. The school immediately adopted a policy banning the armbands. The students continued to wear them and were suspended. Tinker took the case to the Supreme Court. In a 7-2 ruling, they decided that the First Amendment did not stop at the schoolhouse door. The landmark ruling of Tinker v. Des Moines changed how schools can regulate speech. A controversial example of students exercising their right can be seen in WCHS as many display the rebel flag. But it is protected speech unless it causes a disruption. We've yet to see it cause a disruption. Now, I know other people don't like it, but because it hasn't caused the disruption, we haven't been able to ban it. The rights of students continued to evolve when, in 1986, Frazier lost his case to the Bethel School District over obscene language. It was decided that obscenities were not to be protected in public schools. This issue is particularly subjective as who decides what is obscene. Well, I think it's hard to define what the line between free speech and be just being offensive for a population, but personally, anything that I think that is morally or ethically just wrong shouldn't be allowed to... So where do you draw the line? Well, we have a dress code policy that says that you can't wear anything that, um, that, that supports illegal activity. Two years later, the Supreme Court made yet another ruling concerning student speech in the case of Hazelwood v. Colmeyer when it was ruled that schools have the right to censor student-sponsored newspapers. So how does our school censor our student-sponsored newspaper? I know with the newspaper, um, we've got what's called administrative review that I, I proof it before it goes out. Um, there have been a couple times when I've asked them to to relook at a story and research it more, but in terms of just killing stories, I haven't done that because I do think it's important for students to have a voice. Since 1969, students' rights have been ever-changing. From the strengthening of student-protected speech in Tinker v. Des Moines to the allowed censorship of student-sponsored newspapers in Hazelwood v. Colmeyer, the rights concerning student speech are not set in stone. Today, the WCHS administration operates under the tenets of TLO safety, discipline, and order, 
when determining whether a student's speech is protected or not. Student speech remains a controversial topic and will likely change in the future.